Good evening. How are you all? Nice to see you again. Thank you for having me again in your beautiful uh, surroundings. Well, look, week one of our new delivery schedule, and uh, from our end, it seemed to uh, go very well. Um, we hope that uh, you found the same. Uh, we did get, receive one email um, from our long lost friends. Um, I say that in jest because uh, we deliver to them every week, but we haven't had a comment for a little while. You may remember the elephant people, uh, <laughs> the Johnson clan. Um, they were most impressed at the, uh, the delicate little Trish that we have um, out there lugging uh, their box up the, up the, up the drive and, uh, and into the house. Uh, so look, hopefully more of the same and that uh, uh, you will continue to enjoy the service. Um, I will make a comment about the website. The website structurally in behind the scenes is not entirely accurate. Trust the map, okay, um, in terms of your delivery schedule. Yeah, just bear with us while we get the website, uh, the nuts and bolts in behind um, sorted. Now we're quite fortunate to have uh, David and Heidi of Marook Farm pop in on their way back from a conference uh, to Victoria and look we had a chance to sit down have a little chat talk about their their place and a few other issues. Uh, we will probably split it up over two weeks because there's, um, there's a little bit there so we'll give you uh, part one today and uh, the rest next week. Here's David and Heidi. I'm sitting here with David and Heidi of Marook Farm Dairy. How are you guys? Good. Uh, they just happen to be on their way back from the Demander Conference, uh, which is uh, an annual conference held in Victoria. Um, but before we get to that, perhaps uh, you'd like to tell us a little bit about your farm. Marook Farm. Farm. Uh, Bulga Plateau, North of Taru, an elevation of about 750 metres. And, um, been certified Demeter for 22 years there. Prior to that, we were in the Hunter Valley for a while, farming. And we uh, milk the birds around 45 cows all year, with, uh, cows and produce yogurt and cheese. Excellent, which some of we have here in front of you. I'm sure many of you have, have seen them before. Now, the unique thing about your farm is that you also uh, produce the yogurts jar, bottle, etc. on site. Yep, got a factory. Mm, yeah. yeah, we have a factory on the farm. Which is fairly unique in this day and age, I imagine. Um, um, yeah. Oh, well, I guess... the first one in New South Wales on the farm. Right. Is there any others in Australia that you're aware of? Oh, yeah, there's quite a lot of them. But there's not many organic or vitamin ones. There's Mangali up in Queensland, but they buy milk. I mean, I think there's only us and Elga that don't buy milk. In. Everyone, Paris Creek, all those organic ones for around us, they do buy milk. In. And they do transport a long way. So we're really conscious that we don't want to do that. And, and hiding on it is simple for us. If you don't make anything, we wouldn't need our service. That's a pretty good one. Um, would you like to tell us a little bit about the yogurts that you make and the cheese, etc.? We pasteurise the milk. Mm -hmm. um, and with yogurt, you've actually got to denature the protein, and uh, oh, you want to really kill all the bacteria you can. So, yogurt everywhere is taken up to around 90 degrees and held there. And then you add a cold chow um, at around 40 degrees and you incubate it to the acid development is correct. Uh, all our cultures are GM free, obviously. Um, and we're pretty unique that we don't <coughs> excuse me, add any milk powder or milk solids, same thing. Yep. Or any setting agents like gelatin and things like that. Some yep. people put in yogurt. And can you explain the term pot set? Pot set, yep. So there's two types of yogurt. There's pot set. In other words, you've got a big vat of milk, so a thousand litres, you put in the culture. And then you fill the individual jars, retail sales, put the lid on obviously, and it sets in the container pot set. The other type of yogurt is stirred yogurt, where you will make a thousand litres in the big batch. Thousand litres, and once it's gone off the set, you actually fill the jar. Okay, and there's something that I. But you couldn't just on that, you couldn't make that type of yogurt stir for the simple reason we don't have the power. Yeah. And if you started to um, stir it, you break the curd. Because if you eat in there yogurt, the curd breaking is very easy because it doesn't have enough powders and you'll see the way dispersing. It's a very delicate set. 
Yep, which is that little curd that we see yeah. that rises to the top yeah. of all your jars. Well, we've got cream on the top yeah. because we don't homogenise. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. And if we didn't homogenise, we wouldn't see the cream. Yeah. yeah. But we don't homogenise because it comes back to our philosophy. It's not even, you know, making anything we wouldn't need And it's natural as possible. Yeah, absolutely. But homogenising is bad news because like, you actually have to smash it. Smash the fact that there's plenty of their web to be helped because the cream rise at the top and yeah. normal milk, you know, you've got a thick yeah. layer of cream. But what they do in the modern is they actually smash it. Mm -hmm. The fact that it's so it actually is all the same size body yeah. and yeah. your body can yeah. separate yeah. out, which is good fat. And yeah, it's absorbed more readily and straight away into the bloodstream. Yeah. Yeah. Homogenisation, yeah. I always encourage people to go and homogenise yeah. their milks yeah. and things so where possible. So if you want skin milk, yogurt, you just skin milk. And yogurts themselves and the yogurt cultures, they work on milk solids. And very briefly, they in an analysis of milk, milk cultures a combination of butter, fat, and protein. Yep. So, obviously, our yogurt is very seasonal. So, in the best time of year, spring, summer, when the cows are fresh and calm. Fantastic food in the We've got really high salts because our butter fat protein is up. Yep. But so in the middle of winter when we're feeding a lot of hay or silage and we're not in a lot of fresh grown food, the solids go down because the butter fat and protein's down. Yep. And you know, the yogurt's get running. Mm. But I thought it was really good having seeds in the area of mm. No, definitely. I mean, and, and fat content is something that people are particularly conscious about. I mean, we have a number of people who want the skin kind of yogurt or the low fat kind of <coughs> yogurt. I mean, and at the end of the day, you're talking about a pretty minor percentage, three point eight grams yeah. on average. But that will vary over the year too. Yeah, as you say, through the course of the cycle. But the other thing too, if you think about yogurt, I mean, if you've got, say, a litre bucket, which is a kilo of yogurt, um, mm. and you have a little bit of date, it's not a lot because, for example, to get a kilo of cheese, it's a litre bucket of yogurt, it's a kilo to get it kilo of cheese, you actually need 10 litres of milk, so it's a very concentrated form of fat. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. There's one thing I, I recall learning of you not so long ago, um, because many yogurts promote the fact that they, they you know, contain acidif acidif acidophilus. acidophilus and bifidus and, and, and the various cultures. But then a lot of them will, will make the yogurt with those live cultures, but then it goes through another pasteurisation process. Yeah, thing which, yeah, which tends to kill off what obviously kills off all the living cultures, whereas yours. Yeah. And I mean, we're not the only ones. There are juicy plenty of many that don't breed pasteurised. But I mean, they're live cultures in it. Yeah. But the acidophilus and bifidus aren't the yogurt cultures. They're actually probiotics and good for your gut flora. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. But then, yeah. What sort of cultures do you like to mention names of cultures that you use when you're making the yogurt? Ah, uh, well, it's yeah, just not really relevant. Like yeah. Like yeah. Like yeah. Like yeah. Like yeah. Like yeah. Good on. So you've just been down to the dinner conference. Yes. Any highlights you'd like to share? The food. The food? Yeah. Uh, it's really good food, which might sound a bit funny, but really that's the basis. The farmers all bring food. The farmers bring food and it's just quality food and flavour. Um, Linton's farm, it's on Greenwood's Orchard every year. That's a real pleasure to see him. It's been... It's Dermot of Wilder and farmers just bring other people up. Yep. From vegetables through to Cheap. wine. <laughs> food, you know, wine, milk, whatever, dry food, yep. fresh food. And Demeter yeah. stands out as the as the, the premier you know, certifying body in Australia. Would you like to tell to share with the people why? Um, well, I'm actually I'm going to talk about this a long time, but really organics like we've been on this a long time, and, and organics in its true form, um, if you like, stem from European practices, peasants, people putting um, straw out and making compost heaps, spread. It's gone a long way to now. Um, most um, farming, they're using fertilisers out of the bag. They might be organically certified, but it's a long way from actually building humus in the soil mm -hmm. and getting your soil development going. I mean, Demet is very strict on not allowing many inputs. There's the um, 500 preparation you're allowed to put in, but it's, it's more about understanding your soil and creating really healthy soil. 
so you know, help us solve these healthy plants, animals are ready to help us healthy plants in the form of vegetables. It's really fundamental to our blood and our to work with the soil. work within the realms of nature. I mean, there's so many organic foods out there now, and it's, I mean, it's really starting to disappoint me to the extent that I, I believe organic conventional in the next 10 years will be the same, simply yeah. because you can go out, if you want to put manure on, you can go and buy a helicopter, put manure that's certified by the other phone, that's all right, and it, it's all meant. It goes yeah. into the same, the same way as an in, inorganic fertilizer. I think as, uh, as the organic industry gets bigger, that, that uh, there's a, a greater drive to expand supply, and perhaps the bigger players, the, 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 the supermarkets and, the, and that kind of thing, are trying to, to, trying to drive a weakening of the organic standards so it can fit that input output model. Well, also, you know, we live in a society that wants instant solutions and people are trying very hard to think of the outside of the square yeah. and so if they go, well, we need nitrogen, oh, we can get that in the pelletised or whatever. But, you know, obviously not everyone will do, we've got access to a lot of the new and not everyone in that situation. But if you go into green resources, there's just lithiums everywhere, mainly in the form of clover. But look at this in, and you know, when you dig down in between the trees, it's just this incredible humus development and, and lots of roots that are just continually breaking down. And if that's part of his management scheme, I mean, it, it would be very easy for him to go out and just buy something. But you know, and that's. Well, in Denver, it's quite an yeah. yeah. And there are different organisations that certify as quite an yeah. And I think it's important levels of standard. standard. Yeah, they, they all don't represent the same thing. No. I have no doubt in, in the future, not only will, like you said, like conventional and, and, and some levels of organic will be pretty similar. There'll be like multiple tiers. I mean, there already is. Multiple tiers of, of uh, organic that's yeah. the year. Yeah, and there is invited and excellent. Yeah. I mean, I think people should trust their mouths. I mean, their mouth and body is going to tell them what they're doing. You said earlier that I thought it was a great uh, statement. You summed it up in one word. People remember taste and yeah. flavour. Yeah. I mean, I don't think people, consumers, want to get bogged down in whether what it is. But for our point of view, Demeter, the standards, if you like, which, if you like, are a bureaucratic, bureaucratic way of saying how we farm because it has to meet paperless regulations. Yeah. But it just makes practical sense to build the humus up in the soil and to do it within the realm of nature. And you know, you don't want to overfeed plants. And everyone talks about, oh, you know, sitting phosphate and all that, but you can overfeed a plant using so-called organic fertilizers. And it would take a long time to explain that, but I could explain it the same way. Um, but you do it conventionally. The plant, the plant will feed naturally, and the only way you can do that is to create humans yeah. so the plant can uptake the nutrients when it wants. And how in, it in a natural way. Yeah. 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 At all. Yeah. 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 Well, in the simple sense, the, the thing that dictates the plant to feed is the sun. And once the plant is feeding, if it has a choice, it's like us. I mean, if you were just given a box of chocolate each day, you'd eat it. But eventually you're going to break down and be sick. <laughs> but if you have a choice of good nutritious food, yeah. and the only way to get that in the soil is through cans. Yeah. The chocolate one could be a little bit close to home, isn't it? As a, well, an me, analogy me to too, mate. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but certainly, you know, animals can really distinguish. You know, if you give animals good food or bad, and young children are the same. Yeah. I think our adult tastes are corrupted. Absolutely. And Children think, and animals uh, yeah. are, are attuned. And they know what's, what they need. Yeah. And I think um, we're, we've lost that. Yeah. Yeah. Until, yeah. until we get sick and then we know what's good for us. Yeah. We can feel it again. Yeah. Yeah. Fuji apples this week, they are absolutely magnificent. Crisp, crunchy, super sweet. They're $6.99 a kilo. All the other apples in terms of eating quality are absolutely first class, fresh off the tree. Bananas this week, we have a choice of both Queensland and New South Wales fruit. It'll be the last lot of New South Wales um, bananas. They're from Barraville. It'll be the last lot for a number of weeks as Tony and I do uh, some charity work in Fiji and they're off to do that for, uh, for a couple of weeks. I had uh, a Nashi pear yesterday, first one in a while, and I have to say it was stunningly nice. Lovely and sweet. 
and uh, that nice crispiness. <clears throat> Kiwi fruit coming down from uh, the Coffs area. Uh, another week or so, we shall have the Combine Kiwi. Now, Organic Feast is quite proud to be part of the Vital Health Tour. This is on Tuesday the 8th of May, 6.30 for a 7pm start at Newcastle City Hall. Uh, Cindy O'Meara, who uh, is well known to many of you, and Dr. Sarah Ferrant. It's a great workshop to learn about health and the beginning of that journey to, uh, to better health. It's an investment of $27 per person and uh, we'll be there in the evening doing something, uh, a little treat for you all. At Organic Feast, we are proud to be having our very first film night. This will be a monthly event, and uh, we're kicking things off with the Food Matters film, Hungry for Change. Uh, and this doco is about creating lasting health. It's a great way, um, if you, you know, in the early stages of, uh, of discovering the way forward, I would encourage you to come along, bring some friends. It's only going to cost you a gold coin to get in. We'll have tea and, uh, and water available in the evening, but you know, if you get a little bit peckish, uh, BYO some snacks. Sunday the 27th of May, we have a healthy lifestyle class here in store. And uh, the feature of the food will be real food with a focus on raw food. And uh, the core uh, tool is the Thermomix, if you like. It's not a Thermomix class, it's not uh, a Thermomix selling, it's not a Thermomix sales pitch, um, but it's a great opportunity to see it in, in action uh, and just how it does make uh, making uh, good food so much more available. If you suffer from a chronic or degenerative condition, uh, you just want to sustain some good health, um, come along and join Sam and Rita. Rita has over 30 years experience in naturopathy and, and look, she knows uh, so much. And uh, Sam is uh, you know, 12 months into uh, her health journey and she's going to share with you many of the things that she's learnt in, uh, in turning around her cancer situation. Still a great range of potatoes. We've got pink fur, purple congos, Tulangi Delight, Royal Blues, Purple Majesty, Dutch Cream, uh, King Edward, Spunta. Uh, look, there's a wonderful range of produce. Uh, we've got some locally grown, pre-certified organic uh, zucchinis. That's the Costa variety, the nice stripy, Calliope. Uh, but in terms of the leafy greens, I'm starting to see definitely the benefit of the rains. Finally, some good abundant supply of kale, both the, uh, the, the black tusk and the, the curly. The snow peas, uh, absolutely stunning. Tomatoes, the quality is a little bit variable in terms of the presentation, um, but look, it is uh, approaching winter. Now, Tokal on this year will be there. It's the 4th to the 6th of May. Uh, there's a couple of great workshops that you can um, go to. Honey, um, good for us inside and out. We know that, good unpasteurized honey. And uh, there's a great opportunity as well to go and learn about um, Biodynamics, healthy soils produce heavy, he healthy food. A little bit of what uh, David and Heidi were talking about earlier. Oh, Andrew will, will see you there. Andrew uh, is going to be a token. Is that right, Andrew? Uh, look, I'd like you all to meet our team. Uh, here's Trish. You'll see her at your place soon, I hope. Hi Trish. Oh, what are you doing? Get away! <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to introduce yourself? No, you don't know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> this is Trish, who doesn't want to introduce herself. Can you give us a wave, Trish? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. She's oh. a bit camera shy. Yes. Very. He <laughs> Here's John. So this is John, one of our our careers. Say hi John. Hello John. <laughs> Give us a wave. Yeah. Hello everybody. You may recognise John as the the owner of Cornerstone Cafe in house. Just down there. Yeah, I had the privilege of uh, running the Cornerstone Cafe here at Organic Feast for three years, which was a, 
a great experience and gave me a great opportunity to meet a lot of interesting people and, and serve them. Um, and that's now transformed into Momo, which is a, a fabulous cafe. So what areas will you be servicing, John? Um, I'll be driving the vans um, down to the eastern Newcastle and eastern Lake area on Tuesdays and western Newcastle and western Lake Macquarie on Wednesday afternoons. Right. Yeah, I became interested and passionate about organics and biodynamics um, probably about 15, 16 years ago when my uh, healthy young son came into the world and we felt the responsibility of uh, what, we, what we were feeding him and it, uh, it grew and grew from there. Um, buying organic food and finding a good network of suppliers and growers has been a, a great adventure for us all. Um, thanks to Organic Feast, of course. Uh, so anyway, I mean, I'll have a great week and um, hopefully we'll catch you on the other side. Ta-da! <laughs>